Catalyst Connect 2024 is the place to master your Pioneer RX software and collaborate with some of the industry's best and brightest minds. Whether you're looking to enhance your pharmacy software expertise or learn the latest in clinical and business practices, Catalyst Connect has all you need to elevate your pharmacy. Register by March 31st for early bird pricing of only $600 per attendee. See you in Nashville. Welcome to the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. Um, new format. We're trying a little bit of a different format. We have a few topics we want to talk about, some things that are topical. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, there's a lot of kind of like spicy stuff going on a little bit in the industry as well. Um, and I think the first thing we want to bring up is the AMA, I'll just say article, that came out around like scope of practice yeah, and kind of their history of kind of, I'll just call it lobbying efforts to kind of crush and crush anything related to uh, extending scope of practice for pharmacy. Wanted to get your takes. So I, I think in, in general, um, the AMA is a great lobbying group for physicians, mm -hmm. right? But they, they kind of came out with this position that said, don't expand scope of practice for already overworked pharmacists. And I was kind of like, yeah, the AMA is finally going to be supportive of pharmacy. Okay. Because I was like, all right, well, pharmacists are overworked. What? cool yeah and you know and i have a bit of a hot take in general about also, pharmacist scope of practice primary cares are overworked as well yeah but yeah primary yeah basically everybody in the healthcare system is overworked but i, I kind of have this weird hot take about pharmacist scope of practice where i'm on the fence a little bit about pharmacists being able to do certain things like prescribe oral contraceptives mm -hmm. right it's like there's a need definitively sure there's an access problem yeah no question but there's also a place where a lot of young women only get a pap smear when they get their annual visit to get their oral contraceptives. So, oh, okay. All right. You know, so like there's some what if things that I don't necessarily want to find out 10 years down the road that the incidence of cervical cancer went way up because people are avoiding people getting, getting yeah, their for, annual. Not avoiding, I guess, yeah. just not not needing to slash yeah. have to to get one. Yeah, in order it, to get the, it was kind of a barrier of entry beforehand yeah, and now yeah. it's not. Good point. But, you know, like. The other stuff like testing and treating for flu and RSV, there are objective tests for that. It's not that hard. The treatments are there. It, it, like, honestly, I don't think a pharmacist needs to be the person to do that. Right? It's a lower right. level thing. Um, but the, the other part about it was that I thought was interesting with the AMA was that they went on to, they really didn't frame their argument around overworked. They were framing around um, pharmacists don't have the skills and a pharmacy degree is not here. I got a great Basically. Quote for yeah. It. Some type of like weird, not equivalent in some way because we have just so much more training. Yeah. It was very like tone deaf and, and not like, okay. They said we like a care team. And then they said training is not equivalent to four years of medical school, three to seven years of residency training and 10,000 to 16,000 hours of clinical training required of physicians definitively true pharmacists mm -hmm. didn't go to school to be diagnosticians none of that work that they're explaining is a diagnostic thing like these are objective tests right right but the other thing about that that fell completely flat was i don't see the ama also far, like down in this piece saying physicians shouldn't be the ones managing medications for patients they got one semester of pharmacology in medical school right. and most of their okay. education comes from other things. Mm -hmm. Pharmacists went to school solely for medication management. Why then does a pharmacist have to call a physician to change from capsules to tablets or up a dose of a cholesterol medication if they can see a lab? Like it's not there. Right. They're, these are things that clearly fall in the scope of a pharmacist's practice that the AMA is protecting against. So if their argument is really about expertise, they don't have an argument. Fair point. I, I think too, through, I look at the lens of like, cause I'm a consumer of healthcare. I'm not a pharmacist, everybody. Um, I think that is obviously obvious on the, on the call, <laughs> on the podcast when I'm on it. Um, but uh, I think about it just being a consumer perspective too. Um, 
man, I just went through this because we we're kind of going through cold and flu season now. I think um, I've got some infor- information from a, a, an IQVIA webinar. I think I want to uh, share, but um, it was going to be like three days to get my son looked at. Like he was down and out, fever, body aches, yada, 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 exhibiting all the like same symptoms that you would normally hear about like either flu or COVID or whatever. Right. And I'm like, man, I just need to like, I'd love to just get him in, get him seen, you know, die, you know, diagnose him, whatever, like do a test, just see. And it was going to be like three, four days. And so, um, pharmacists can't do it here in Texas either. And so outside of the hours of certain urgent care places turns into ER visits, right. And, and things like that. So I just look at this from an access perspective for myself, for being a consumer. And if you're a free market person, there's a little bit of like, I think the market's trying to tell you, we want it. We want this. And, and so like, I, I think the market's even kind of dictating that you, you have to think of something and, and there's other countries doing it successfully too. I, I, I believe, I think it's successful. So don't come at me um, too hard yeah. there, but. Well, and, and that's the other part, you know, you're, you're talking about access where there are large portions of the country where people don't have regular access to primary care providers. Oh, uh, rural. Yeah. Especially yeah. in rural populations. And Absolutely. you know, the way medical school is framed, most physicians are going into it thinking about specializing, right? So you have, way more specialist in certain places than you need, especially in urban environments. And you're going to go to school and owe a quarter million dollars or more. You don't want to go be a pediatrician or a geriatrician or a, you know, primary care provider because they pay substantially less. Mm -hmm. So you, you have two problems that this thing that the AMA is talking about, like talking about physicians or leaders. All right, cool. Great. No United, one's, someone's saying that's yeah, not true. The right? United States produces the finest physicians in the world, the best diagnosticians in the world. Great. No one's arguing that. We're just saying that if you have flu or RSV, things where you can pull a diagnostic test and, frankly, a computer program could tell you if it's positive or not. Right. Yeah. Cool. And, you know, the, the, even the escalation of care. Say you go to the pharmacy and you get a flu test positive you get tamiflu it doesn't work the first thing your pharmacist is going to tell you go see your physician right right? like there's a clear line of escalation here that is common sense and we follow that all the time and they're acting like it can't be done yeah i think this spurred out of um some legislation some Mm -hmm. legislated some legislative efforts to get basically pharmacists the ability to prescribe Paxlovid, right? Um, yeah. I think that's where this stems from. Now, every year they're kind of beating back that for some reason in some some state or, or some type of, uh, uh, I'll just say, lobbying effort. But um, I don't know. I just feel like there's a lot of demonstration, too, over the last couple of years mm-hmm. that pharmacists are, and, and pharmacies play a really important role in that, especially access for rural health, man, like yeah. what you said. So that's... I don't know. That was part of the part that I was like, that sounded a little tone deaf. Yeah. For it, me. It, it sounded like if you really cared about patient interactions right. and patient care, this is a no brainer, right. right? Like I don't know any pharmacist, myself included, that like if I wanted to diagnose and prescribe drugs, I would have gone to medical school. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's that simple. I like medication. I like medication management. That's firmly in the scope of practice for a pharmacist. Don't want to like, I honestly don't want to do any kind of diagnostic work in a physician capability. Frankly, I'm unqualified to do so. <laughs> Especially, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, but this was You're just legal now. It, yeah, it was crazy that they were like there was no real argument there, other than like it felt very like I'm just doing this to protect my turf, yeah, not yeah. to do anything about being helpful. Right. Yeah. I'm just like look at all of the stuff I do. It's more than you. And this specific thing I'm pointing out where right. I stack up really great. Yeah. Um, just to build a little bit of a moat around. Yeah. Around that, I think. Yeah. So. And, and to be fair, I think the APHA response was really quite good and unusually forceful little, from APHA. A little spicy. Right? Yeah. A little, little bit. Like APHA is usually yeah. kind of like, hey, we, we tow the, yeah. the what's best for pharmacy. But they were even like, hey, this was tone deaf and. Yeah. And frankly wrong like they came out swinging yeah. on that um which rightfully so right yeah like uh th- there's a vested interest for that too so um okay anything else you want to add around the ama apha notably i haven't seen response a around that 
further response from the AMA saying that, oops, my bad. We yeah. were kind of jerks about that. Yeah. You can, you can go look to like one of the, one of the things they brought up, like the, every year I feel like they're actually kind of doing this in some way. Um, there was an article, I think about a year ago or something like that, where it's like, don't, it don't increase the scope of practice for pharmacists. Maybe it wasn't pharmacists specifically, but it felt, I think it was, um, they're already overworked. Yeah. And, and that was like another article from, from about a year ago. And I'm like, so are you, yeah. <laughs> so like, that doesn't like, I, yeah. I don't know. Like it just didn't make sense. So, yeah. Well, and but. scope of practice is a weird thing too, right? Like if you look at the way nurse practitioners and physician assistants and, you know, a bunch of other mid-level practitioners have expanded their scope. Some of that's a little bit scary too. And so there are some legitimate arguments about once you open the door, how mm. far does the door open? Yeah. Yeah. No, and um, that should be watched. And, and, right? and those yeah. are things that you should continue to ask. Right. So like there are a lot of places where nurse practitioners and PAs are practicing on like the gray end of their license. Yeah. Okay. All right. It was meant to be a supervised position. Sometimes in a lot of States they have autonomy to do a lot of stuff good for them. Some of them are quite yeah. capable, some not. Um, and you know, like even when I was back at Walgreens, like slinging drugs, the, uh, <laughs> slinging, slinging drugs, drugs everybody. we may have to edit that one out. <laughs> no, um, we're leaving it in, leave it in, um, leave it in Brandon. But you know, all like right. we would get dentists all the time who would write for drugs that were clearly not in the normal scope of dental practice, right? Like if you're seeing a, a dentist writing a prescription for an antibiotic for his family, technically yeah. not okay yeah, yeah, right right those are scope creeps that are the same kind of problem you, you have to watch them nobody's saying don't pay attention to it I, I think back to a little bit not to beat this too much um but like i think about warfare and clinics and things like that like in my in my old days i used to trudge through the basements of health systems because that's where pharmacy was yep. uh typically in a large health system environment so uh shout out to my health system pharmacist peeps i love you um but there's a lot of like difficult to dose stuff that makes right. total sense like and that's really like a lot of what you see your clinical pharmacist or i wouldn't even say just mm -hmm. clinical pharmacists but those pharmacists that have expertise that are working with the care team that are like totally like valued there right, right. Uh, no yeah. one's questioning that and, they're the folks that can do that better right. than most physicians in that space. Yeah. Right. And the ones that are doing medication management. Right. Right. Yeah. And part of the care team, which is, I think what almost everybody wants is just to say, you have a care team, right? A yeah. physician does the things that they're amazing at and better than anyone else. Yeah. And the other people will do those things, right? Like think about how cool it would be if you went to a pharmacy and said, you know, had a blood pressure reading and it was wild and the pharmacist could just take your lisinopril from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrams, right. prevent a doctor visit, maybe even a hospitalization. It, there's a crazy amount of savings that you can do there that a pharmacist literally got a doctorate to do. Yeah. But that's not part of this. Yeah, or, or difficult to swallow, right? Yeah. Like, oh, like, let me just go ahead and make that call and make sure you're getting the meds you need. Yeah, um, yeah that, makes, that makes total sense. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Let's beat a different horse for a while. Josh is yeah, <laughs> crap out of a different horse. Uh, all right. So that's uh, just our resp like, just wanted to talk through that. That's fairly topical. It's kind of hitting the hitting the social media platforms. Big response out of APH APHA. So that was cool. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up. I think both, this is an article both of both me and you read, and it's relevant because there's also um, a little bit of I guess housekeeping here. NCPA's fly in for like their legislative efforts is April seventeenth and eighteenth. So. Um, if you can, obviously with the retroactive DIR fee, um, kind of environment we're in where we're kind of post that into this new one, um, probably a really, really relevant time to think about, Hey, can I make that trip or not? And, you know, I know we're helping them with data. I think IQV and everybody else is helping them with data and cases. So, uh, well, I'll, I wanted to make sure I say that, throw that out there. Um, that's again, April 17th, 18th it's for the NCPA fly in, go to their website, take a look at it kind of inspiration for that meeting, I was looking at other articles and there's one by, um, so if you guys, we'll put it in the show notes uh, for, by Wendell Potter, it's his Substack. It's a Substack called Healthcare Uncovered, I believe. And they really have some really like nice short articles and points that you can hit on when you're talking to either your state legislative folks, your, your congressional folks, um, whatever. But um, there's a study done by John Hopkins and the University of Utah and here, Here's kind of a, here's some of the stats from it. And this is around generics. So generics and Part D plans. Um, so for every $100 spent, 
on um, generic drugs and a Part D plan, $41. So 41% of those dollars went to a PBM. Um, $30 went to a manufacturer. $17 went to the pharmacy. And $12 went to the wholesaler. Like there's just a fundamental thing I find gross about some of that where the person almost getting paid the least, almost the least, I would say, is the one actually providing the care. Uh, drug manufacturer getting paid for making the drugs? Yeah, I don't have a problem with no that. No problem with that for yeah. me. Um, a PBN taking $41, like almost three times as much as the pharmacy? Yeah. Um, just wild. And it's, it's one of those things when you lay it out simply and you look at it that way, I think everybody knows that the ecosystem has some skewed incentives, right? That the PBM is taking more than their share is like kind of the prevailing thought, but that lays it out in such a way that you're like, Oh man, it, it's completely messed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, and it's on generics. It's not, we always hear about the story about brands and you're like brand mm -hmm. rebates and the competition brands have to have to get on formularies and whoever gives right. the PBMs the best uh, overall cost. I'll just say for cost savings, they, they usually, as long as it meets whatever requirements they have for, for formulary performance, great. But these are generics. Yeah. These are the commodity of the space and dispense 90% of the time. Right. Well, and even when you think like that's per hundred dollars, if you think about yeah. where, you know, where we see and we talk to a lot of pharmacies who are saying, you know, I'm losing money on 30% of the scripts I, I dispense. But think about like if that's per true on a, on a percent basis and your, your whole drug is maybe a $5 drug, mm -hmm. you made no money on it. Like right. zero dollars. Like it costs you way more to dispense it and pay for operations and, and workflow than it did to get paid on the drug. Right. It's just it, not sustainable. Just, and that's kind of the proof behind the back of that. Like, yeah, it, it just was like, just, just, that was the, like, it was, I don't know, it was put in a succinct way. We all kind of know those numbers in some way. We've always heard something, but it was just put in such a, a nice tidy way to think about it where they're getting like two and a half times more than the person checking, making sure they're one, you're not killing the patient. All of the things that you do as a pharmacist to dispense a drug. Um, and you have hard cost with labor Right. materials to, to actually do that. And you're getting, and, and, and the way, the reason I'm harping on that so much, I don't think you tell me if I'm wrong, uh, Josh used to work in managed care. I'll just say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I did. Uh, tell me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's a ton of formulary management around like widely available generics. Like there's really not, there's, I, I don't know if the yeah. cost structure even it, I, let's, I, let's just say, I know it doesn't support. Yeah, I, I would the two and a half take. I, I would that. be shocked to find that like even more than maybe a dollar or two of that 40 goes to formulary management. Right. Right? So, There's a lot of okay. a lot of bureaucracy that goes in there. Sorry. Getting getting kind of getting get kind of riled up. My bad. Yeah. My bad, everybody. All right. But um, you know, the other part that I saw about that that I was thinking about how messed up the world of pharmacy is right now. And I was looking at that and I was like, man, most pharmacists would kill to make 17 bucks off of a drug. <laughs> And it was like, yeah, fam. oh man, that's like, yeah, no. that, that's the, that's the environment we're in where it's like $17 sounds like a pretty good amount of money to make on a drug. And that's just bonkers. I know. Right. Um, uh, the, the second part of this article was, uh, highlighting a, and sorry, I'm looking down cause I have to read some of this stuff. Um, a university of Toledo study as well. So he's kind of, he kind of combined a couple of different, um, really well done research uh, articles and kind of like put them in a nice succinct uh, one, like basically almost one page scrollable on your computer article where it said, here's the other, here's the other piece. And uh, we all know this, but the, I just wanted to say it um, again. I'm trying to prep people for the NCPA fly in a little bit is the 79% of the time Part D patients who haven't yet met their deductible can get their drugs cheaper. I think this is again about generics folks can get their drugs cheaper by paying cash than using other insurance and paying the price, quote unquote, negotiated by the BBM. So 79% of the time, if you're not at risk at moving into catastrophic coverage, which I don't think there's a donut hole anymore, um, but it, like you're paying, you're having, a, you pay for Part D, right? You, right. you literally pay for Part D coverage and then you're going to go basically pay for the drug as well and you could just pay cash. Right. 70, almost 80% of the time. You just pay cash for it. Yeah. And, you know, beyond that, like that kind of highlights the ostensibly PBMs were built to bring down cost. Right. But they 
they, I think the evidence at this point is overwhelming that they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. That's and kind the, of like the, you know, the, that's kind of the whole like synopsis yeah, like, of the, of the article, great. like especially around is, generics. Anyway. Right. Right. You're just, the thing that they were specifically built to do, they probably did early on. And then they figured out all these other ways and games to make money out of it. And they got so good at it that they haven't lowered costs. Yeah. They've increased, you know, administrative burden across the board. And now you're looking at like they're taking two and a half times more than the, uh, the crazy more than part. any player in this space. Yeah. yeah like that, even group. if your argument yeah. is like they should, you know, a pharmacist may should get less of that than the PBM. Like, the fact that they're making more than the manufacturer and the person who made it and the yeah. person who like made sure it was appropriate to give it to the patient. Yeah, if you, if you take you know into I mean? the, yeah, you take into account the manufacturer and even if you want to say manufacturer and wholesale are together, right. the PBMs takes that amount of money for doing what? I know I, it, it's, it's beyond it's me. Wild. I, uh, it's a great article. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, uh, so that in case anybody wants to see it or share it or whatever, um, I, I, I know like, don't, don't come at me, PCMA, <laughs> um, or do, or, or do, uh, I, I, either way, like, um, there's, there's things they do with, with brands and things like that, that I get lower costs for maybe insurers and stuff like that. But this generics piece is turning into like almost no point for having insurance for generics. And maybe just catastrophic coverage for brands. And that's, yeah, you know, like, it's that's kind of like where we're leaning into. It feels yeah. like. So, like, I was talking to my my aunt the other day on and the way. Still not paying home pharmacies work. for those, by the way. But whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, I was talking to my aunt on the way home from work the other day, and she's kind of in that like retired, but not old enough for Medicare yet. Yeah. So she um, she got a um, an Affordable Care Act plan on the the exchange, and she was like, honestly, the plan's great. It, no out of pocket, has a high deductible, but that's what she was thinking about. And like the, the prescription coverage on it, there's basically the same kind of deal where it's just wildly high deductible and no premium. And she was like, I just went to my local pharmacy and paid cash because it was more cost effective for her to pay cash on her cheap generics than it was to pay a monthly premium on a plan that yeah. barely covered them in the first place. Yeah, And you're kind of like, the, the weird part is that's kind of what insurance was intended for, right? Yeah, it was yeah, covered. If you really it, go back yeah. to, yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, take away the argument for, you know, the fact that you probably should be able to have insurance in this country if you wanted it. But also, like, insurance was built to be catastrophic coverage. It's not, risk pooling, right? Yeah, yeah right? Yeah. Like, and so I was like, hmm, it's interesting that she figured that out on her own. Yeah, yeah. And I was, yeah, man, my aunt's dude, doing all right. Dude, especially with seniors, man. Like it's just, there's, think they have to think about that. You know, they have, yeah. them, you know, so many of them are on a fixed income. They're like, what's the best bang for my buck? Always thinking about that. So that makes total sense. But um, anyway, that was a, a really like strong article I thought was really well written. It's really succinct too. Um, the guy does a lot of stuff as well. And I, I, I can't endorse everything he writes cause I haven't read it. So, uh, forgive me if there's something else weird in the, in the sub stack, but, uh, that was a great article. I probably need to have my intern pull those primary research articles and read them too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Maybe yeah, validate me before. Yeah, like, like, uh, like we, <laughs> we just put a uh, 10 minutes into a podcast about how this guy's a genius and know, we might find out that, um, <laughs> he's not <laughs> if, well, if we validate you are Wendell, uh, we may ask you to come on. I mean, uh, I mean it's hard to say cause the Johns Hopkins <laughs> universities relatively I've well heard of them. It, they're kind of unknown so <laughs> right right i heard they're good at stuff yeah. um in general but um okay i got like uh, a couple more like let's get a pharmacist take on uh pharmacy school applications and like that number came out a few months ago uh but i feel like it's still fairly timely uh, i think the stat was uh, applications dropped 22 percent basically over year between 22 and 23 so we don't have data for 23 24 but um, 22%. And the only other thing I will say before that, before I get your take on it, is between 2000 and 20, uh, the year 2000 and year 2020, um, basically programs, pharmacy programs themselves increased by like 79%. So we had this, mm -hmm. I remember being in the industry all the way back to 2000, probably three is when I got into kind of like pharmacy in some way. Um, and that was like on the early parts of like all these programs expanding. And so the, the, at the time it was like, stop, 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 stop. The industry was kind of going, Hey, we're producing too much, too many, too many, too fast. And now here we are kind of hitting a cliff Yep. on that. So 
Yeah, it, it's funny. I, I've been on the tail end of the pharmacist shortage. So I graduated in 2008 when there was still kind of a shortage. So mm-hmm. pharmacists were coming out and they were getting like Did you get really a BMW or anything? Yeah. No, I, <laughs> was, I was on the tail end. <laughs> All, right. All right. I got a job and a small sign-on bonus. <laughs> I got it, um, I got it. But, you know, like they had that piece where their pharmacist shortage, they had, it, this was kind of the tail end of the result in like the mid nineties when they changed the farm, the pharmacy program degree from a bachelor's to a doctorate. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you had this semi pharmacist generation where they had an extra year in school and you had a whole bunch of other stuff go on. And so in 2008, we had pharmacists coming out and then you started just seeing rapid proliferation of pharmacy schools mm. and everybody was saying, stop. Yeah, this is a yeah, this is a time limited thing. You don't need to go. And what happened was all these pharmacy schools came up, and they were like the the private pharmacy schools. They're charging like fifty grand a year, like crazy, crazy house. Oh, really? Yeah, they're, they're super expensive. Oh, I did, okay. Um, and you know, and even Texas, I think we went from four or five pharmacy schools to something like nine. Yeah, I think almost double digits. Um, and, and you know, like, I think when I entered pharmacy school, you had about thirteen hundred applicants for. 125 spots so you had some pretty decent competition to get into the pharmacy schools you know you had your pcats you had all the other stuff that goes on and now with all these schools just rapidly expanding and you combine that with the news where you know you see the the retail pharmacists just look horrible when you go in there they're overworked they look like zombies yeah nobody's happy back there so and you frankly you get a lot of pharmacists uh, we talked to about this with Bill last yeah, week. Yeah, that's, that's true. You get a lot of pharmacies telling kids don't go to pharmacy school. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a friend of mine who made quite a bit of money in the pharmacy world tell his daughter don't go to pharmacy school. Absolutely don't do it. Huh. Um, so, you know, you, you see that combination of like far more schools than there were before buckled with more people in industry telling their friends, family, and relatives not to go into it. And it just creates this big chasm. And the result of that is you have a bunch of pharmacy schools that don't have a lot of requirements to get in um, and dropping, you know, PCATs or whatever. Kind I, could, of, I could get in? and eh, not you. Nice. Oh, all right. <laughs> but you just have to be reasonably oh, right, intelligent. Right, never mind, never mind. Then. All right. um, but yeah, so you have, you have way too many people or way too many schools and underqualified candidates coming in. Um and I think the net result of that is going to be a huge correction. You can't come out of school and owe one hundred and fifty to two hundred thousand dollars and not have a job. Yeah. And even worse, you can't come out of that school owe that much money and not be able to pass your NAPLEX. I mean, NAPLEX right. is not a difficult yeah. test, right? It's minimum competency. And so you you saw NAPLEX rates drop, and you know. Oh, that's right. I remember that uh, yeah. a year so, or two ago. We saw that. So I think you're going to see a correction where non public universities or private universities that aren't amazing Mm -hmm. will close. Got it. It is just not sustainable. This is kind of a little bit of like market correction almost. I don't mean, I'm a finance major by trade everyone. So a little bit of market correction, but also a little bit of like working, like secular stuff, like working conditions are yeah, kind of hairy, especially in some of the, the, the larger chains environment. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a little bit of like a little bit of that probably working into it and a little bit of market correction overall. It yeah, like I think it's a combination of the two. And I, I, I hope that the colleges of pharmacy are smarter as a collective and say some of these schools can't and shouldn't make it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like nobody wants to like if you're thinking about like applicants and stuff like um, you keep adding if you kept adding programs, well, people on the bottom get bigger, too. Right. Yeah. Like, and if you look at pass rates. Um, okay, cool. That's probably an indicator of how successful students can really typically on average be in mm-hmm. there. And if you're seeing like lower and lower in Aplex scores, why, why am I going to go there? <laughs> why am I going yeah, there? And, and to you be know, fair, like, no I think the top tier schools have not changed their requirements. You right. know, I talked to the, the Dean of Pharmacy at University of Texas where I went and he was like, we admitted 125 people. We did not drop our standards. Nice. I'm okay. Like yeah, yeah. that's like, great. Put out high quality, am, amazing. Admitted pharmacists. a few more. Yeah. And the reality Didn't is the, the job okay. is going to change, right? Yeah. Pharmacy is going to move into a place where you need fewer people, but you need more skilled people. Mm-hmm. Um, great. If okay. you're putting out unqualified pharmacists, you're just going to get chewed up and yeah. and left behind in the yeah. retail world. And that frankly is the college's fault. Yeah. That's not the student's fault. All right. And if I get lit up on the, the internet, <laughs> Come at him. that's Come fine. At him. I'll take it. Uh, yeah. Um, at Josh Allen for, I'm just kidding. <laughs>
Last thing I want to hit on before we go, uh, a couple, just a couple points. Um, so for anybody who has time um, or is a nerd like me around data, uh, Drugstore News and um, IQVIA did a webinar that's pretty, it's open. It's an open webinar. You just got to obviously fill out the webinar form and boom, you can watch it. So um, great, a lot of great data in that if you're just kind of looking for like, uh, I'd say like macro indicators of around of the market itself. Um, and, and I know everybody's particular, uh, we have a lot of business owners in, in our base, so everybody's particular situation is different, but uh, good article. A um, couple things I wanted to hit up. Um, the top three launches for drugs were what, Josh, for last year? I bet you probably know. You, I mean, you probably know, my, my but guess they're all is one it, category. Yeah, my guess is it's probably Wigovi, Zetbound, and Monjoro. No, no, no. So the top three launches, because those were launched previously. Oh, that's fair. So all just right. for just last year, the top three launches were all RSV vaccines. Huh. Yeah. At least that's the bullet point from a summary perspective. So like there's some other stuff right. in there that's that's not necessarily what's the top spent for the year, right? But the yeah. top launches. Well, we can see my skills as a pharmacist and how much I'm paying attention to dispensing rates. Literally dwindling. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so total sales, this is in dollars. Um, total sales for 23, uh, up 13%, 13.5%. Um, LTC sales up 11.8%. Um, so what's that's telling you? is that that market continues to recover post COVID. And yeah. if y'all remember, right, everybody was not everybody, but a lot of folks were yanking yeah, seniors out of, out of a uh, group environment. Did, did they mention anything about that for, and I also apparently not a big enough nerd like you. And I didn't watch <laughs> that. Did they mention the growth being at LTC at home? Um, they said home health. So I don't know if they, they, I don't think they have that bucketed um, Got it. with that data set, but I do think they bucketed home health pretty flat, like two point, like a two something percent. Um, so that's home health though. I don't think necessarily same thing, but, um, I may change my tune when I'm older, but if I'm going to get old and can't do anything, I don't know if I want to be in my home to do it. I want to be in a cool facility where there's like other old people around there. We can, we can, yeah. Right. Pickleball. So think about like, (laughs) this, this is a off topic, but you know, like you go to like a nursing home today and they were, you know, those were people in a generation pre computer, you know, my generation in a nursing home is going to be playing like GoldenEye 007 yeah, totally, on a right? Nintendo 64, yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, like yeah, when next we get down there, the road, like... It's Fortnite after yeah, that, Yeah, right? right? Like <laughs> right, all the yeah. little Minecraft, yeah. the, the old yeah. people playing Minecraft right, doing right. stuff. I, I kind of look forward to that. I, I don't know. I'm like, oh, you get, uh, you, Dude, you let me sit in a room right now and do Gran Turismo on a racing simulator and... <laughs> I don't know that I need to do anything else. All right. All right. Y'all are knowing things about Josh. You never knew. Um, also though, real quick, before I get into a couple more stats, um, pickleball, I think I'm, I think I'm falling in love. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. Yeah. For real. I love it. I love it. Um, I think our next guest on is like a crazy pickleballer. Um, or I don't know when he's on, but I think it's pretty soon. Yep. Uh, Scott Pace calling you out. I'm ready. I'm not ready. Yeah. <laughs> Although <laughs> when we played the couple of weeks ago, I talked to Scott before that and he was, he was telling me his adventures in pickleballing and going from country club to a regular place where people are actually really good. Oh, Oh, and all right. I, and, he'll, I, and, he'll I, and I'll kill me then. And right. I told Scott, I was like, well, I hope that against most of the people I'm playing with, I'm just younger and in better shape. And he was like, it doesn't matter. You're going to get murdered. <laughs> it doesn't. And, oh, you um, know so little. <laughs> and yeah, it was right. like, oh, you sweet summer child. Okay. Um, but yeah, I got murdered. Yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Uh, general consensus is you actually need to know what you're doing there. Yeah, it turns out it's a skill-based game. Yes, it is. Um, all right, so generic, uh, generics were only 4% of, uh, grew only by 4%. So um, continued to see deflation. They said, I believe 22 uh, generic deflation, which... Um, talk about how you want from a pharmacy's perspective. I don't think it's been great um, from an insurer's perspective that are paying PBMs. I don't think it's even being, I don't think they've gotten to realize that deflation much either, but um, 7% versus 11% the previous year. So maybe it's normalizing. Don't know um, uh, from that perspective. And then the last thing I guess I wanted to say was this isn't doom and gloom. So this isn't all just doom and gloom. So we're positive people. I promise. Um, in the chain space, uh, mostly, but there's 2,000, a little over 2,000 less pharmacies than there were four years ago. Um, 
CVS is on the heels of the 900 stores that are going to close. They're in the third year of that. Um, so that's a huge chunk of it. Yeah. Uh, Rite Aid's obviously going to continue to close stores as they go through and wade through those waters. Um, Albertsons and Kroger's may have to. Yeah. If they, if that goes through, right. Um, the, the Kroger's is buying Albertsons, if I remember right. Yeah, something like that. And uh, so, and then obviously everyone, I th- not everyone, but uh, if you know, if you're in Florida, you know, um, Aldi bought Southeastern Grocers, another 200 stores that basically all got shuttered. They so, did that so, with, uh, it was, was it Brookshire's as well? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's true. That's true. Walgreens bought, I think Walgreens. CVS, I can't remember. Someone in a Some, corporate one of, chain environment. One of those, bought, yes, yeah. one of those bought uh, Brookshire's as well, the, uh, the pharmacies there. So, um, so for the most of the folks that we have here, like I would say the segment of regional chain and community independent pharmacy, like and from a store count perspective, I think from my perspective, don't, don't come at me too hard. Everyone is, I, I don't, I think they're more nimble and just more creative at figuring out how to, and probably just more passionate about, about pharmacy and, as well, just to, to stay, stay in business, stay the course and expand. We're seeing folks expand. We're seeing yeah. folks grow. And it may be an optimistic take and I, I hope it plays out, but the fact is people are still older and sicker and chronic diseases. So yeah. you still need pharmacists and yeah. pharmacies. Um, so if they, I think if they can suffer through this next couple of pieces, like there's a lot of really positive things going around with PBM legislation. We just need a yeah, couple of dominoes really to fall. Yep. And independent pharmacy might be the most resilient area of pharmacy in general. Yeah. So if they can hang it out, that's the I word I was looking for. Resiliency. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yep, yep. Just so much in that in SAT that. word of the week. I know, right? <laughs> Clearly Josh's SAT score was higher than mine. <laughs> I'm like, they good at stuff. You know what I mean? So, but anyway, that's everything I had that I was covering. Um, uh, we covered the, the spicy response from APHA. So, uh, I hope everyone liked it. Um, Wait, this, we don't, we don't have any prescribables this week. Oh, dude. Yeah. You? Let's do this. Dude. All right. I, yeah. My own segment. You, you started you, a you segment came prepared. You I came know. prepared my own segment. Yeah. So we have, do we do a segment at the end of every show? At least I'm making everyone do it yeah. for, for an end of three that <laughs> you I, far, almost forgot to do. Right. When I, when I almost forgot to do, clearly I'm a person who leaves his keys everywhere as well. Um, uh, prescribable. So it's like, what are you reading, watching or listening to? You think the world slash would be interested in work or fun either, or obviously you've already give Gran Turismo a plug. I spend a fair amount of time on Gran Turismo. (laughs) There is no denying that. Um, I think the, I'm not really reading anything right now. I was reading the advantage last week. Uh, Still doing that. That's on my homework list. I have to finish that. Um, the the my podcast of the the moment right now is the Tosh show. Like I used to, I grew up on Daniel Tosh and Tosh point oh, and he started his own podcast, and it's clearly better than ours. Um, <laughs> but he he interviews like non famous people that he finds interesting. Yeah, yeah. And like he's a deceptively good interviewer. He's like kind of had the same vein of John Stewart. So like he kind of comes across as this like I'm a dumb affable comedian. But he's really, really good at talking to people. That's so good. if you haven't watched it, it does contain explicit it, it, language. Yeah, let's so, go. Let, um, let's, let's be real. Uh, sensitive viewers should not watch that show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I, I guess mine would be, well, I think I brought a few, to be honest. Like what we talked about, one of the prescribables is Wendell Potter's Substack. Yeah, go. Yeah. Uh, and there's only, actually, if you don't know about pharmacy Substack, it's out there. It's in there's a Benjamin Jolly's got one. Randy McDonough was doing one for a little while. Um, so it's there. It's look at that. Um, Substack for, for pharmacy is, is, is pretty active in healthcare in general as well. So, so go look at that. Um, as, uh, that if you're a data nerd, go watch that webinar. Uh, that's, that's kind of my two work ones right now. I'm watching Jack Reacher and season two, uh, solid. I'm just, I, yeah, I'm halfway through season two. So yeah. good. It's good. It's good. It's just as good as the first one. So I thought the first one was mm. good. It's a little campy at times. I thought the first season was better than the second season. Oh, you did? Now, okay. The second season so, was good. I liked the team up event, but yeah, I don't know. The so first far, one was, was my game. Okay. All right. So far I'm, I'm into it. So, um, I'm, I'm watching that. So watch that. It's good. It's on Amazon prime. Um, if you hate Amazon, I'm sorry, but I think we have every streaming service known to man uh, at yeah. my house, uh, unfortunately. So yeah, I stream it all as well. Uh, so that I save no money cord cutting. But yep. anyway, all right, everyone. Uh, hope you liked the different format. We know uh, we'll 
might continue to sprinkle it in. Um, and uh, if not, just kind of be nice to me. If that's all right. <laughs> but notably, don't be nice to me. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you for watching the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us wherever you get your podcast. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more pharmacy professionals like you.